Science is, in current times, a readily available methodology for engaging with reality, taught in various forms from a young age in school through to university and the upper echelons of academia. It is popularized through the works of pundits and amateurs alike. And yet, a core grasp on the term is often lost in contemporary settings. What defines science and the method of being scientific gets left behind. Why it is necessary is poorly understood or disregarded entirely. And this affects our capacity to practice and engage with scientific thinking outside of the lecture theatre and sometimes within. If we don't understand science properly and cannot respect it as deserved, we risk dismissing the institutions it engenders and the results it delivers, stressing our ability to act and think in cohesion. We lose our grounding for a common epistemology. This article seeks to shine some light on the fundamental necessity of science, its functionality, and the question of fallibility. Though it is not always taught explicitly, every student of science should understand what pragmatically necessitates something like a scientific method from first principles. To begin that lesson, we need only ask one question. Can we tell what is real. As the physicists Alan Sokal and Jean Brickmont point out in their critique, Fashionable Nonsense, we possess access to the physical world only through our sensations, our senses, acting as a kind of medium. When persistent, those sensations provide a reasonable confirmation of a reality extant outside of our own consciousness. For example, a flower tends to remain a flower from one moment to the next, regardless of how you might will it to be otherwise, or of who is perceiving it. In contrast, the fairy we see during a psychedelic trip only exists for the duration of that trip, and is apparent only to our own consciousness, rendering it unreliably real. We cannot will it into existence for others. The consistent information we receive from our senses must, however, still be interpreted through a nebulous interplay of our nervous system and consciousness, effectively placing what we perceive to some extent in the realm of the subjective. Immanuel Kant alluded to a level of inherent subjectivity within the eye of the individual in his, in his critique of pure reason, believing that thinking, understanding, and reasoning are subordinate to personality, and exist first with a personal premise. Understood through the lens of neuropsychology, the information we perceive via our senses is determined by an interpretive mental structure, brackets our subjective consciousness and unconsciousness, end brackets, that is predominantly oriented by an individual's value and motivational systems. In simpler terms, you do not perceive the world as it is, but as your mind decides or is influenced to construe it. What does this mean? It means that though a flower can only be apprehended in a limited number of ways, this is not the case for all things. As a subject as a subject matter becomes more complex, smaller, or infinitely larger in nature, or abstracted from the physical reality our senses encounter, The manner in which it is understood and interpreted can diversify, that is, there is more room for error. Similarly, as a a person's mind becomes inclined to imaginatively extrapolate reality beyond the most basic conceptual bounds of a subject matter, through creative impulse, self-affirmed belief, hallucination, even fear or paranoia, differences in the supposedly factual judgments that we make become almost inevitable. This creates a problem. For there to be a constant contention between groups and individuals about their subjective understanding of reality, their their collective mapping of experience down to the smallest detail, would simply lead to a never-ending cycle of conflict, arbitrary dominance and cheap knowledge, ready to be discarded as the next charismatic body obtains self-proclaimed omniscience. How do we avoid such an outcome? How do we avoid such an outcome? we ask the next question. How do we tell what is real? 
In the answer, we find our scientific method. Using the tool of reason, we institute a logically constrained evaluative framework that seeks to identify what is common across multiple perceptions, discarding bias and establishing something approaching a factual judgment, brackets, while distinguishing it from a value judgment, end brackets, and use that to delineate a universal, a universal truth about a component of reality. Thus are we able to accommodate a shared and stable epistemology, calibrated by the insights of what we call science. So, we've ascertained that science attempts to reliably explain the coherence of our experience, beyond reasonable doubt. But it's worth noting how it does this. Shortly summarised, modern science relies on the combined analytical and, or I should say, analytic and creative ingenuity of mankind, coupled with the precision of machines to propose hypotheses and consolidate theories, which are verified or disproven via the quantitative method or constraint of experimentation. Science is, in many ways, a mere extension of a rational attitude that many of us employ in our daily lives to some degree, though not always with consistency. We use induction to infer an encapsulating truth or theory from something specific, such as a pattern or trend, and we use de deduction to predict something specific from a known theory. We use what we believe to be evidence to aid us in our decision making. But this process is not always perfect. In fact, it is likely being made more difficult in the current era for many by the fog of conflicting information, increasingly politicized and ideologized generated on the media platforms that have ushered in an era of internet-based communication and knowledge sharing, all of which makes a familiarity with a certain process within the scientific method so valuable, that of analytical thinking. Science teaches us to think. It doesn't just ask us to consider what is true, but more importantly, what isn't true. For something to be thought of as reliably true, all avenues of investigation that show why it in fact isn't true or can't be true must be explored and proven as vigorously as possible to be relevant. A hypothesis must prove consistent across all the levels of analysis it encompasses to be actionable and made theory, which itself is always up for falsification. Examples are instructive, and to find an example of thinking that fails the precepts of the scientific method, we need look no further than the field of astrology. Those who practice astrology act on information provided by simple conscious apprehension, observing the existence of two coinciding facts present to one experience, one's experience, the fact of differences between individuals and the fact of movement in the constellations. By a feat of imaginative gymnastics, a causal relationship is identified between those two observations with conveniently flexible and generalized explanations. The analytic truth behind what we perceive, however, is not so easily confirmed, particularly when each subject itself warrants a sophisticated individual understanding. Astrology does not subject its theories to testing or experimentation. It does not attempt to pass a method of falsification, nor are its interpretations constrained by empirical observations, which is unsurprising, because if they were, the concept would quickly prove itself defunct. Are all Gemini really that extroverted? And if they are not, if the correlation is statistically insignificant, what then? How do you explain extroversion in zodiacs? Are there other variables that explain your observations better? Where is the effective link between the realities of personality and that of a star? Each soothsayer will have their own interpretation. All you have to do is find a package that sounds like you and voila. Astrological thought makes no attempt to exist in cohesion with what we know at the level of physics, neuroscience, or psychology. It fails a universal test of reason and logical integrity. To further em emphasize and continue on the prior line of reasoning, the true gift of science to the individual lies not in the results of the laboratory, but rather in instructing one's ability to think. As an example, I'll analyze the methods used within my undergraduate studies of chemistry that encourage the development of proper thinking. 
Chemistry, I might add, is a discipline whose ideas do not typically foster incentives for psychological attachment or cognitive bias that may encourage deviation from scientific thought processes. Post-completion of a practical, we were required to write a report. Reports would typically possess sections for an introduction, aim, data, results, discussion, and conclusion. All are necessary. It is, it is important that the student understands the background information involved in their experiment and knows specifically what they are focusing their attention on. It is equally important to be able to conceptualize empirical results and to use them to construct explanatory models and communicate fact. The real lesson, however, resides in the discussion. Within this component, the student is forced to consider, to truly consider what happened during the experiment and why. He is forced to look for error within all aspects of the practical, from the human error involved in the use of equipment and reagent, to the error of the method itself and his own understanding of the theory employed. The student is encouraged to run an internal program of competing voices, each doing their best to find issue with the thoughts at hand, or the solution proposed, so that what is left is not a collection of thoughts formed from half-dried clay but rigorously chiselled marble. If insufficient knowledge is available, then more must be acquired before a worthy proposition can be formed, unless you desire poor outcomes. By employing such a methodology of thought and action, we can attempt to make an object and careful tool out of something, the brain, that is inherently subjective and heavy-handed in nature. If one ever wishes to truly think and make claims about reality, of one truth proving dominant over another, adopting such an intellectual process is requisite. Truth is not a relativist notion that exists simply within the eye of the beholder, where multiple parties can possess their own truths, equally valid. We have the truth, insofar as we can reliably ascertain it, beyond the subjective belief of a few. That truth tends to be the prerogative of science, and the methods of determination it employs. To call science the elite method of engaging with reality would be unproductive and inappropriate. Rather, it'd be more appropriate to consider it as the most reliable method of engaging with reality. Now, this isn't to say that the scientific endeavour isn't infallible. It most certainly is, though this might depend on your determination of fallible. One could make the case that the falsification of a scientific theory through the verification of another is not evidence of fallibility per se, but a natural occurrence in the knowledge updating process driven by new ideas and better data. You could question whether the means by which the theory was developed were adequately scientific, and if there were failures within the method to adhere to proper practice. An idea, I deliver, an idea delivered or endeavour performed under the banner of science can prove fallible if it oversteps its bounds, acts in negligence, or is unduly influenced, that is, if its grounding is shown to be unscientific. To see evidence of fallibility in science at the institutional level, we need only look at recent events relating to the origins of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Though Chinese authorities had stated that the wet that the Wuhan wet market was the source of this novel virus, a link was quickly established between it and the nearby Wuhan Institute of Virology, known for conducting research on coronaviruses. However, any mention of the possibility that COVID-19 may have originated within this lab was met with extreme scepticism and derision, labelled conspiratorial and xenophobic by politicians and scientists alike. Regardless of whether the virus did originate in the lab or not, the condemning and dismissive approach taken to this line of reasoning was highly unscientific. Through unverified, though unverified, the the lab leak hypothesis was in no way disproven and was not unscientific in its conception. What was, in fact, unscientific happened to be the process by which the wet market leak origins were proclaimed to be factual, a stance now called into doubt by the growing body of evidence that supports a lab leak hypothesis and how alternative hypotheses were received within the scientific community. Scientific institutions, or 
institutions that purport to purport to utilize science should never act with the presumption that their truths are so paramount that any contradiction must be censored. The true order of things must forever be determined on the perennial battleground of unrestricted speech, which is by nature terra nullius. There is no other means by which the best ideas can rise and die when necessary. We cannot, however, simply do away with our institutions. In fact, it is in them that we must continually attempt to place our trust, so that progress may be made. Though it might prove incorrect in hindsight, the consensus of current science should always be our first port of call. Why? Because we should still choose to align ourselves with the authorities on sense-making, rather than act against it every time we perceive an error that contradicts the consensus. The scientific paradigm is still the most reliable one we can adopt. As an opinion-holding member of the public, or academia for that matter, it is possible to be correct based on shallow suspicions and incorrect based on rational assumptions, brackets, which may prove in the future to have been irrational, end brackets. Which mode of thought, you might ask, is better? The safer option is to be incorrect based on rational assumptions that hold with the available information and circumstance. This choice is going to be in line with reality for the majority of cases. What is purported to be irrational to be rational can suddenly turn on its head, but there must be very clear evidence to support that fact, brought by a source of expertise. We should not dine to think of ourselves as revolutionaries at every corner. Though a fundamental aspect of contemporary progress, the study of science should not necessarily result in a rejection of those things that do not fall readily under its wing, as can be the case. It is not immediately obvious, for example, that science can provide us with value judgments in the same way it can offer factual ones. For this, we must likely look to other fields of collective human experience. For example, to study the humanities is to familiarize yourself with the collected wisdom of our civilization. If you study art and music, you do it to witness and contribute to the beauty of creative expression. There is much life, mystery, and wonder within the stories, traditions, and myths of the people of the past that should be used to complement the sterile realities given to us by science, rather than destroyed by it. All functions of human productivity and inquisition have their place. Science is merely the tool we use to calibrate and better understand those functions. The prominent analytical psychologist of the 20th century, Carl G. Jung, philosophized that societies had ages, and each age a spirit, characterized by the prevailing paradigms, ideologies, and societal groupthink of the time. To be in line with this spirit was to be decent, reasonable, and normal. Living in a century abundant with information, technology, and modernized societies, the spirit of our age must surely be the spirit of science. If this is the case, then that spirit should be properly understood. Science is about constraints and bias removal, operating on a substrate of logic and reason. It teaches you to engage at multiple levels of analysis and to see how, how accurately an idea or line of reasoning carries through them, such as whether an idea is compatible at the level of sociology, psychology, and neurophysiology, or if a theory of physical law holds true at the level of molecule, atom, and subatomic particle. It imparts a desire to work from first principles instead of convenient assumptions. It teaches us that we can be wrong, some facts do exist independent of our claims, and it is by comparison to these facts that our claims have to be evaluated. Science is, however, not perfect. As an institution, it is susceptible to the flaws of human nature. The only way we can overcome those flaws is through transparency and open conversation, not through dismissal, censorship, or intolerance. We should use it not to sterilize our existence, but to, cal to calibrate it. Ultimately, science gives us the ability to look deep into our world, be it physical or abstract, in a way that holds consistent to a universal reality. To see the layers, the complexity, the truth of things. Employed with humility and grace alongside those other things that contribute to our collective experience, 
Science aids us to communicate and exist in global cohesion like never before.